here. Okay, so what I want you to do with you today is try to understand the role of emotions in group learning. So I have an insight, I can say, that I think that emotion can be very beneficial for group learning. But I need also to challenge this idea and see how it works, etc. And so what we want to do today is to understand how lots of, of emotions and feminism can give us some insight about these things. So, okay, here there is the main thesis. Today we speak about positive emotions, so not the broad meaning of emotion, but positive emotions, so as happiness, justness, contentment, patience, kindness, these kind of emotions. And thinking the third claim is that positive emotions are motives for joint epistemic action. And the joint epistemic action that we discuss with you today will be biological inquiry. And the second claim is that they are facilitating conditions for cooperation in group learning. The facilitating condition has to do for me with the establishment of the right and proper environment for group learning. So I will speak about the contextual uh, function performed by positive emotion and exactly in establishing uh, coordination and uh, cooperation. And I will use the logical inquiry and mostly Socratic dialogue as a case study to understand their function <coughs> in group learning. And then in the second part of the talk, I will pose some challenges from a feminist philosopher. And I do not anticipate them we will sit together before. And at the end, I will speak about training and beauty epistemology. OK? So this is an introduction that I think that it could be quite interesting because today we are doing philosophy of education. So when we speak about dialogical inquiry, there is a tradition that understands dialogical inquiry as a philosophical practice. And this has to do with the interpretation provided by Pierre Hadot, that is a French scholar that understood mostly ancient philosophy as a way of life. So this idea that the philosophy has to do with the action that people together do in order to foster their understanding of reality. There is also this idea that philosophy is an activity that is pursued in community. So it discusses mostly stoicism, materialism, but also the academia, etc., to understand how community could be the proper and the able for doing philosophy together. So I stress this idea of doing philosophy. Here there is just a list that I do not discuss today, maybe in the QA, if you are interested, I can say to you something, but I just just to say that this is not something that has to do just with the history of philosophy or the ancient time, but there is a, I can say, a quite deep movement in education nowadays of using philosophy, philosophical practice, as a tool for doing philosophy together and a tool for foster uh, the students' autonomy, critical thinking, etc. And Socratic dialogue is one of these practice. So there is exactly this idea that we can come back to the ancient model of Socratic dialogue and establish a new model of education, having Socrates as an example. And then there are other philosophical systems, philosophical community, spiritual exercises, but okay, we don't have time for doing it together now, but uh, we will see. So we will speak about the Socratic dialogue. I would like to start with this detail from the painting of Raffaello, the Academia. And on the right side of the picture, you will see Socrates, and Socrates is discussing with people. So the idea is that Socrates is questioning everyone that he made in the Agora on the street, etc. This was his way of doing philosophy. And then Plato would say that exactly philosophical knowledge, so the epistemic achievement, is attained as a result of dialogues among friends. It's important to stress here among friends. So there is this idea of friendship. So when we speak about philosophical community or philosophical community of inquiry, there is this idea that there is a friendship that binds together the interlocutors. And this, in my understanding, is not just something by accident, but as uh, an important role in the production of knowledge. And okay, here there is this quite 
poetic expression that they get acknowledged which lights up like a flame. So when interlocutors are discussing together, there is an insight can appear like a flame and bounce back from all the others, etc. So this is the ancient model. Uh, now I can say that there is a music Hi. Hi. Welcome. So I just started to say that we are speaking about the role of positive emotion in group learning and group dialogue. And so now I'm discussing as a case study Socratic dialogue. And so there is also this idea in the contemporary method that the starting point of any philosophical inquiry is the experience. So the starting point of the dialogue are examples. So the interlocutors should provide an example and show that from this example, a question may arise. So it's important to show that questions that then will be discussed in the dialogical uh, inquiry are not just abstract things, but that have a, a ground in the experience. So in this method, induction is the main methodology that is, is used. So just to say something about the contemporary way of, of doing Socratic dialogue, I really like the, There are many approaches of doing this. Okay? I really like the method that is performed in Germany. And so it's the German Socratic method. Method here with the picture of Nina Specht. I think that she's a great woman. Usually people say that she's just a teacher, not a philosopher. This say something to us today, I can say. And no many people know her. Usually only Leonard Nelson is known, that is the man, is the founder of the German method, but Mina not. So I'm working a bit on Mina, <laughs> and I think that her approach is very interesting because she said that we need to enhance the confidence among the students in order to achieve a real shared and participated knowledge in the daily life. And she also <coughs> started two school, understood as school of lies. So the idea that the students were living there together, so sharing also not only education as the, the activity specific that we are done, but also eating together, sleeping together, and all this stuff. And this was interesting because Nina did this data in 1930 in Germany, and all of you know what happened in this period in Germany. So for her, doing Socratic dialogue was also a practice of resistance, of freedom, trying to show how through reason and emotion together we can nurture our, our ability for think by our own and doing philosophy. So it was a, a way to against totalitarianism of thinking and settle. And also her story is quite interesting, but I don't have time here, but she has to move from Germany to the Netherlands, then she comes to the UK, and, the, and she started also to work with the UNESCO. And so she developed this pedagogical method grounded on Socrates and Socratic dialogue. And this is one of the core idea that is quite interesting for me, this idea of think with one another. It's a quite weird expression, but it is exactly the translation from the German. So, meet, I, under, thinking. So, the thinking that arises from meet with the other, so me and you, thinking with one another. So, there is the idea that this kind of knowledge is not a common knowledge, and not only my knowledge, but it's something in between, I can say, that arises exactly in our social interaction. And it has to do with the capacity of questioning and critical thinking and all this stuff. And also another thing that I think that is important for epistemology is this idea that Mina had that the goal of Socratic dialogue is understanding and non-knowledge. And especially here in Edinburgh we discuss a lot about this. We know that the Duncan preacher has published about this, etc. And I think that it's quite insightful to see that Socratic dialogue is understood as a practice to foster understanding, understood as a, a deeper way of knowledge instead of collection of knowledge, etc. And okay, for them, <coughs> the idea is understanding is deeper than knowledge because it's 
strictly connected to the experience and arise also by existential question. So they have in the back also this idea that uh, <coughs> the question that I suppose are not abstract, but has to do with our life. And then they can become abstract, but uh, ever resonant in our life and in our goal, in our education, etc. So starting from the German method, I uh, since six, seven years, I started to develop a new model of Socratic dialogue that I call the Antigua Socratic dialogue, where I try to emphasize the role of emotions in dialogue. So I'm, th I'm taking this idea of Nina that is important to build up the confidence among the members, and the platonic idea of friendship at the ground of philosophical inquiry, and try to uh, think about some tools that can enhance the role of emotion there as beneficial, because as we know, emotion can be also detrimental for good knowledge. We will discuss a bit about this. So try to create the proper environment in order to uh, attain the beneficial role from an epistemic point of view of emotion in group learning. So I understand in this context, emotion are motivational states. I'm not the only one. This is one of the <coughs> main definition of emotion in philosophy of emotions, so as motives for action. So these, these powers that make us doing something that is relevant for us to attain our goal. This is the first point. Then the second point that is more original, so the first point is quite accepted by everyone. Okay, so the second one that is more original is about distributing emotions. So understanding emotion not as a private mental state, but it's something that happened in between, so as in the subjective space. And I can be discussed in just a few minutes the distributed account. But the idea that if we take group learning as a way of group knowledge, we can understand a mental state and emotions as well as something that are distributed among the groups. And it's interesting to show the functionality of them and what's happening in this interaction. And then the third point that this two is quite original, to understand emotion as a transformative power. I use this expression. So emotion are something that build up the character, that transform the character. And in this topic it's interesting to see how they can facilitate the production of an epistemic responsible energy. So I think that certain kinds of emotion can enhance the responsibility toward the others, and thus, and this has to do with all we will discuss about this later on, feminist epistemology, the quality of the epistemic agent and how responsibility for the epistemic practice is important. And I think that emotion can help for, for this. So this picture has been made by Michelle, that is here, so thank you to the three. I'm, uh, just to say that I'm doing something also here in Adiro with this uh, Socratic dialogue, and I call these emotions for learning. So it was a project with the, within the widening participation program of the university, and the idea is exactly to work in connection with the curriculum for excellence and think how emotion can enhance and support the enthusiasm and motivation for learning, and I use exactly the Socratic dialogue, so using the role of question, etc. So, okay, so let's go to the epistemological side of my talk, and it's quite a, a way of analyzing what they say until now. So, a lot of these case studies are Socratic dialogue in education or philosophical practice in education. So as I have already told you, I try to understand dialogical inquiry as distributed cognition. Here I think that we have a very good definition of what distributed cognition may mean. And uh, what is important for me is this idea that the task that is obtained by the, the practice, the group learning practice, is something that cannot be processed by a single individual. So, uh, here we can find exactly why doing Socratic inquiry or group learning is important because through this practice we can attain something that we cannot attain just with a, uh, 
a, 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 an inquiry to form just study our own in the library, etc. So there is this idea that the communitarian aspect of inquiry has a role, and there is this idea that exactly the cooperation of different functions that are performed by different interlocutors, the commission is maximized. So something new emerged. In my understanding, if we can grasp this idea as a, an emergent conception of knowledge. So the idea that knowledge is not just the sum of the singular properties processed by the singular individuals, but it's something new that allies to the interaction and putting system the different function. Okay, so it differs from the most common summative account about groups. So the idea that the groups are just the sum of the different singular individuals as isolated uh, interlocutors. So I have already said this that uh, I take the logical inquiry as group learning, and it's interesting that the inquiry with Carter, we can realize new function. And here I highlight five points that, that are important for us. The first one is the complementarity between the logical partners. And this is uh, uh, one point that is, is very strong by Archie's Commission in the Wild and all of these literature. So that we need that the different functions, so is the role of the different, different functions are put in system together and through their complementarity we can achieve something new. And I think that this idea has also an antecedent in the history of education and in this idea of the zone of proximal development that uh, uh, Vygotsky has developed this idea more than 100 years ago. There is the idea that uh, a student, a student can do so something, can be attained just by his own, okay? But there is something that uh, he can, she or he cannot attain just by his own. And he needs the help, the cooperation of the teacher first, but also of the peers around him. And this space of cooperation is exactly the zone of proximal development. So there is the first day, what I can do by my own, and then there is a zone of development that through the cooperation and complementarity with others, we can achieve something new. And interesting that starting from there, there is also Bruner, the constructivist approach, developed this idea of scaffolding, etc. There were started many tools in order to attain this. But from a theoretical point of view, I think that is interesting that it, to think about this zone of the de development. This is interesting because we need complementarity, we need the difference. So I need someone that knows something different from me and that can learn from me through dialogue, uh, through the dialogue and other practice. And also this main idea that the learning of individuals is fostered by being in a group. Okay. So there are study, many studies, many studies, critical evidence about this. And also this idea that cognition is improved by being in a group and provide a group cognitive achievement. So the framework is to understand the group as dynamic role, so something that produces new things and the social interaction are, I can say, the, the powers that create these, these new things. And among these, we have also emotion that we will say. So another point about the dialogical inquiry is, on this, is understanding it as joint commitment as well. So because when we think about the student commission, could arise also this idea that these things happen just automatically. So just being in a group and these new skills happen just magically, I can say. Uh, one thing that the uh, philosophy uh, of education stressed a lot and I agree with them, that is not enough. We need the deliberation, the, the motivation, the side, the wish, the voluntary aspect of being the subject, the active subject of my learning process. And so I think that at the ground of this idea is that the different principles of a group learning process of Sudapidaru is the idea that each individual should be motivated to the joint commitment, should be motivated to achieve 
the epistemic world with others, and so bring all her capacity into the groups. Right. So here we can find also this idea of autonomy and agency. So if we just take the idea of distributed cognition, maybe there is a idea, ah, but we, we miss the individuals, the subject, and all this stuff. And even if we are working on this topic, we have to find a balance between what can happen through the dynamics within a group and what as a subject, a real subject of my process of inquiry, I can bring in. So stressing the role of autonomy, that is very important. And I can just, just a, a very quick note that the Mina Speck as well, because Mina was cranky, <laughs> she <laughs> stressed this idea of autonomy so much, okay? So here we have two definitions of dialogical inquiry that you can read by, by your own. And you see, I just stressed this idea of the voluntary aspect of uh, the, the learning practice, and also, and this is the thing that we are going to discuss now, the idea that uh, the hypotheses that are at work there are not just cognitive abilities, but also affective abilities. So in this process of social interaction, in this dynamic, whole, uh, we have different function, and one of, of the function is performed by, by the affective steps required. So here we have the affective domain of learning. I think that uh, is very important, but we have already done this, so it's you not know, very new. The idea that we should overcome the stereotype about emotion as irrational mental space. And we have different traditions that show this, and just refer to phenomenology and existentialism. So the idea of the primacy of experience, and again, you know, phenomenology derived from Kant, it's blah, 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 okay? And the idea of the living body, okay? So that uh, in the practice of education, we are, the subject is acting, its action is from the perspective of the living body. So is there with his gaze, her gaze, her body, her desire, with everything, not just with her mind, okay? And this idea, we can get some evidence also from neuroscience and evolutionary psychology. It's interesting that in, in the 90s, the work that was used for express this idea was interaction. So interaction between, among, emotions and cognition now, the word that you use is more integration. So you see that emotion and cognition are integrated. And we have evidence about it that I cannot discuss, but we have some evidence provided by neuroscience uh, about it. And then there is the third approach that I think that is important to take into consideration when we speak about the effective domain of learning, that is inactivism. So the idea that the living and feeling body are moved by a primordial affectivity that push to action and create this constitutive entanglement with the environment, the natural and the social environment. And here I'm referring to the work provided by Giovanna Colombetti. Okay, so very quickly, because we don't have so much time, but I want just to frame this, uh, this work within the conceptual models of emotion in contemporary philosophy of emotions. So very sketchy, and of course I will, uh, I cannot take in consideration everything or the approaches, but you know there are cognitivists that understood emotion mostly as mental states, and they accept the positional attitude identity thesis, so the idea that the notion can be translated in composition. Then we have the perceptual model that uh, presents many points in common with cognitivism, but uh, it would challenge this idea that emotion should always be expressed as proposition. And so try to understand emotion more as percept perceptual experience. So as through perception, we can grasp 
some value of the reality, there is the idea that emotion as well. So as perception can provide us some information about reality. And there is also a political ground for this idea that if we embrace just the standard cognitive approach, we cannot recognize that the non-human animals and babies uh, experience emotions because they are not proposition, they do not possess proposition knowledge. And I think that from a feminist point of view, this is very challenging. Okay? Then there is the feeling-centered approach. So they understood emotion as feelings. So this usually is understood as the opposite of cognitivism, right? And so the idea that there are feelings of the body, and William James is the historical president of this, of this model, and so this is the part, say, that the emotion has just this. The first point is a reaction to a stimulus that derived from the environment, and then after this bodily reaction, a cognitive state and property may arise. But first, there is the reaction of the body, and this is emotion as feeling. And then there is the first approach, that is the one that I embrace, because it's the wider one, the multidisciplinary approach. <laughs> and here we have many, many people. But the here is that. Anthropology, neuroscience, political science, etc., and the work of the philosophers is trying to build up a model taking in account all the results that we find from that. And the two approaches that I like more the enacted approach of emotion and the expanded approach of emotion for me belong exactly to this whole group. And so in this fourth group, we find the 4EA. Cognition, so the idea that the cognition is always embodied, embedded, and active, affected, and sometimes extended, as Mark and Dave are saying in the wonderful <laughs> paper, for we are good. <laughs> I really like uh, their, their paper. And so the idea is uh, um, fostering the role of body, environment, but mostly the social interaction as vehicle of cognition. And regarding this point, I'm working on the third way of the extended mind hypothesis, so the idea that the mapping is extended to social interaction. And Sean Gallagher is the proponent of the view. So coming back to our, uh, so this was mostly the epistemological side of my talk. Now I'm trying to merge in this epistemological side with philosophy of education, and suddenly I'm speaking about affective ability. So I would like to discuss this idea of ability. So I'm not depicting emotion or affectivity as a very broad <laughs> container of all bodily uh, states, mental states, uh, reaction, etc., but the history side of this thing. But I think that it can be very helpful in the learning process. And so here we find the two ways uh, to the ability to be useful to me. So the first one, uh, and I just say understanding affective ability of motives for the cognitive processes. Here we have two points. So how affective ability could be motivation. The first is making the topic more stable, the group graphs in the value. And so this has been shown this very good example by Michael Brady, for example, here in Scotland. So shows the connection between emotion, perception, and memory. Okay, an idea that truly we can grasp the value of the object. Then the second point is that they are exactly by Michael Brady.
the common research. So here I'm working more on the, uh, gra the emotional ground that uh, is at the base of responsibility. I know that this is quite uh, tricky and we can discuss a lot about this if responsibility as an emotional ground or not, blah, blah, blah. but I think that we, can, we cannot do it now. But, and try to understand responsibility as care in some way, so finding the emotional component of care, etc. Okay, so here we have motiva motivation and awareness. So motivation as studying and attention. I think that this is quite clear. And also I try to emphasize this idea of awareness. So understanding emotion also as affect. So awareness of our bodily states, our experience, and so the awareness of the states of ourselves and the others. And so the sensitivity, I can say. So here we have this cooperative group learning. I think that in play there are all these notions. The first one is autonomy, that is very important, but it is connected with positive interdependence. Okay, so I'm not thinking about a solitary thinker, but an autonomous agent is embedded within a cooperative practice and that establish positive relationship with others. And this created a joint commitment, togetherness, cohesion, and trust and confidence. So I have already said something about this. This idea that emotions are dynamic processes, so not just private state. And also something that constitutes the quality of the relationship. So it's to do exactly with this quality, where the, the taste, I can say, of the relationship the color of the relationship, right? And so emotion may reinforce or undermine the social bond among the members of the group learning, depends from their quality, yes. So I have to run uh, a bit because we don't have so much time. This is one of my main claims. So we need to establish a positive, effective environment. And this is an enabling condition for group learning and good knowledge, I think that this has to do also with what the human philosophy are trying to do when they speak about the friendly environment, cooperation and all, uh, all the stuff. So I'm trying also to understand what are the, the emotions that can nurture this kind of environment. But here we are at the challenge. So I run a bit, sorry. So the question, and I think that it's quite obvious and naive, is that knowledge reliable? Of course, the answer is not always, and we have to, to work in order to build up the proper environment in order to make it an, an ability and not something disruptive. So the question is, which are the effective abilities that can have a positive beneficial impact in our knowledge? And also here, the. <laughs> Answer is quite many positive, even positive emotions, of course. <laughs> but okay, here I'm a bit joking, but I'm, I'm serious about it. So I think that, uh, and there are also many empirical evidence about it that uh, positive emotion could define the subject well being and the group well being. So there are studies how happiness enhances cognition, and positive psychology is working a lot on this. And, all their results are very interesting. And here there are just all these parts of the experiments that we cannot discuss now. So this has to do also with empathy, but also this is a very big <laughs> topic. So I just go beyond it because we don't have time, but there is this idea that empathy and altruism and understand empathy as an engaged empathy. So something that brings action and a positive action for, for the others. And so cooperation as virtue. So there is the idea that if I feel the other, I am uh, more motivated to cooperate with the other and try to build up our joint commitment. So, okay, this is the thing that I wanted to say for the last part of the topic because I to do more with feminists. So, yes. All these things I can say, okay, very well. And Wien Stolt has emphasized this role of emotions in knowledge. Here we have uh, the picture of Maria Zambrano, the thinking, and etc. 
Bath. <laughs> bath and this bath is quite interesting. Feminist epistemologies has also underlined that our knowledge is never neutral because of the not only because of the power of language but also because of the dynamics that uh, are embedded in the group, mostly the power dynamics that depend also by hierarchy and the uh, social role that the different interlocutors uh, perform in the groups. So it seems here we have Judith Butler, you know, the idea that the, our identity is a social construction and depends by the role that we assume in a group. So it seems that from this point of view, group knowledge cannot be objective and unbiased. And also, the challenge say that it's mostly through emotions. These uh, stereotypes and bias can have a detrimental role in group learning and knowledge. So until now, I spoke about the positive value of emotions. So affecting knowledge, both partition engagement, performance, but then here we find the risk of manipulation or the, the challenge about the systemic injustice, bias, and stereotypes. And this has to do mostly about also the idea that the social economical messages spread up in our identity through exactly emotional experience. Just think about the marketing or advertising, how strong it is, and all the things that feminist as as shown through through the years. And these things has to do also with the kind of group and environment that we built up. So also how many main values are embedded in the group. As uh, I underline the idea of main values. So not just the presence of uh, men or women because there are also many women that embrace men value, right? And also men that can embrace more feminine values. So how men value connect more to power, hierarchy, war, etc. But this is a very big topic we cannot discuss now. But how they are embedded in our practice of group learning, group knowledge. So we have negative and positive emotion that uh, are in play in this practice. Here we have you know, the words by Martin Nussbaum about shame and disgust knowledge, etc., etc., and also Richard Foucault and all the French philosophers that has show how the power filtered through our body and mostly through our emotion and is very disruptive and build up our identity in a different way. Okay, so the main question is, could emotion support the process of deconstruction or are too susceptible to the power of these groups? Are there enough strong? And so my answer has to do again coming back to our case study. So my answer now I have just to summarize because we don't have time. My answer has to do with exactly this integration of cognition or and emotion. So I think that emotion by their own are not enough strong that we are very susceptible. So they need a strong cooperation with critical thinking, lack of autonomy, skepticism, the value of skepticism, and also, but this I think that is not something that will, uh, a strong objection to my thesis, and that leads to dismiss my thesis, but something that make it more real. So understanding that uh, if cognition is really in the wild, and if emotions are in the wild, as I should say, we have to take care of all the risks that are always there and take care that in every practice of group knowledge and group cognition we can face these kind of challenges. So to be aware of them and try to train ourselves to recognize them and build up a better environment that can uh, help that these things do not happen. And this has to do with other things on feminist epistemology that we cannot discuss now. Okay, and this has to do again with this idea of responsibility and the joint commitment. Okay, so I think that this cartoon is quite interesting. And I do not give you any comment because just this by its own. Okay, so this is my idea of an engaged ethics of knowledge. I'm referring to Miranda Fritter or 
of course, but I think that uh, in this account, the idea is that emotion can work as difference. Here I'm referring to uh, the Rida and the Rosa, so as this desire that can be as a force for transformation, for establishing all this more good environment for our cooperation. Then this idea of collective responsibility and the idea of responsibility as a respondio from the Latin roots, so to provide the proper and right answer to the others too, because we are in this constitutional relationship, so I embrace this idea of the relational self. And also the idea of vulnerability of the ones that are always embedded in our practice. So do not think that we can attain one day a neutral cognition without uh, no, no one of these risks and problems, but uh, knowing that uh, we always face this, and so we have to be trained on recognizing them and build up the proper environment. And so the very of training and then nursing affective abilities. And this has to do with what I have already said and the first part of my talk, so build up the responsibility, the responsible systemic agent. This is something that uh, is the idea of uh, a virtue account of group knowledge is it has been delivered here in Edinburgh by Oresi, Oresi, Spalermo, and Duncan, teachers again, and they say that cognitive abilities plus social interaction produce group knowledge. My contribution here is to say that it's not only cognitive abilities, but also affective abilities. Okay? But the framework is the same. And I don't say anything about this because this is another topic and I don't have time about this, but how certain kind of emotion, positive emotion as epistemic emotion, could be the building blocks of intellectual virtues. And this is important for thinking about this responsible epistemic agent. This has to do with disposition, training, Aristotle, etc., etc. So I just conclude with this slide. So the idea. I think that uh, my main insight and what I want to, to do and share with you is that at the core, at the ground of the learning process, there is an inner desire for the understanding. And since it's a desire, emotion has a role there, certain kind of emotion. So much work has been done in this idea. But I really would like to stress this idea that the ground of the learning process is affected. And since the, I understood that activity and emotion as uh, social processes of interaction, the ground of this kind of knowledge is intersubject. So it's a process of group learning. And this, I, I hope that uh, I, you uh, grasp this idea. This does not mean that uh, I deny the role of rationality, but I really try to show how cognition and emotion are integrated in this process that create knowledge as something that has really to do with our life, with our experience. And this has to do again with what I say in the first part of the talk about philosophical practice, way of life, and the idea that the most beautiful discoveries can be obtained together. Thank you. <laughs>